Pan Pan Psychast. Part four: Further analysis and discussion with a French accent. I will not do that, Jack. Discussion? No, I won't. It's okay. There's the. Uh, There'll be uproar. There will be, but I can live with that. Okay. I uh, can, I can, is I can, either or 16 on Twitter? It that, is. That's you. Like, yeah. um, <laughs> feel free to send hate, but I know you won't. <laughs> Too lazy for it. <laughs> <laughs> you antagonizing the audience. <laughs> Get him, guys. <laughs> <laughs> pitchforks at your house <laughs> and that was when it for it you know like in the future the record scratches you're probably wondering how i got here nailed to a cross why have you forsaken me <laughs> okay so let's uh, engage in some further analysis and <laughs> discussion got it in there somewhere um guys what i'm interested genuinely i'm interested in what you both took from the novel like take home message um what was the meaning for you? It's like a hermeneutical approach and a reflection on your own life, your own philosophy. What did the full, uh, what message are you going to take home in your doggy bag? <laughs> well, so I think there's one one kind of really great take all that I think everybody can appreciate, which is that, first of all, you're not as good as you think you are. Um, that like, And also this almost, I think the positive side of that message is that, like, I think some people can get a little bit too worried about, like, you know, how they're doing or, like, like are they meeting the standards of themselves and of others? Mm. And just to kind of be, a, like, a little bit more honest with yourself and just say, like, like no, I'm a very much a flawed person who will continue to make more mistakes throughout my life. And that, like, I, I often actually allow things to happen that I could have stopped, but there's so much going on in my life that I couldn't possibly get everything right. And in that sense, yeah, we are all guilty in that way of allowing things to happen. But you can't, you literally can't meet the moral standards required by society or mm. by yourself. It's, it is literally impossible. There is mm -hmm. like, there's the whole like moral saint fallacy, right? Like you, you cannot be a moral saint. You have to accept part of you is technically a quote bad person mm -hmm. and be okay with that. And this is the thing that's been censored, isn't it? Again, from last week when we were talking about the example of Jesus, like even he can't be a moral saint. You've got no chance. Is yeah, the, is you the can't. message. Yeah. And so I think if there's one good takeaway, that, that's got to be high on my list. Is there a, a is there a message which you're taking home to to the hills, Ollie? Um, what like a moral message? Yeah, just something. What's what's the meaning of the fall for you? Um, well, I I enjoyed the book a lot. I mean, I thought the book was really really good. Um, I think I I agree with Andy. I think the idea that you know you're not as good as you think you are, and that's okay. I think you know in terms of our human psychology, I think that's quite useful, especially in times mm -hmm. of stress. I think that's definitely something worth kind of thinking about. And I think for me, it, it did make me kind of reflect quite a lot on the nature of guilt mm -hmm. and what guilt is and how we deal with guilt. Because I think that you know guilt's a really weird thing, and people were kind of weird with guilt. That's a bit of an odd phrase, but so like some people can do really horrific things and feel no guilt whatsoever, mm. or behave in a really certain way. I don't know, maybe leaders of certain countries that may invade other countries for what they think is good reasons, right, and then good. think that they can just become a Catholic and wash their hands clean with it. No specific reference there. Um, and some <laughs> people, honestly, and I know individuals that will have the most guilt if they don't if they accidentally cut someone up in traffic, yeah, or if they like. I don't, don't say the guy. right thing. They'll be nice to someone, but they're not nice enough. Um, so, and I think, you know, some some individual I, I met have literally like not a shred of guilt for living like quite a selfish lifestyle. Mm. And some people live a really selfless lifestyle and still feel this kind of like incredible burden of guilt. Um, and I think that just kind of reflecting on that is quite helpful. So just for people who do feel that, maybe, you know, reading this book, they could read it and be like, oh, well, you know what? Do I just carry around a lot of guilt with me, which is not helpful? Um, and if anything is kind of a bit of a burden that I don't need to carry or the people that kind of aren't guilty at all or the people that are kind of like John Baptiste at the start of the book that are kind of just being, you know, crazy, cool, handsome lawyer. Um, maybe just maybe have a think about your behavior and not that you should feel guilty, but there's probably things that you 
need might need to reflect on. But isn't is Jean Baptiste when he says, "I pin my, myself everything again, and without the laughter this time, I haven't changed my way of life. I continue to love myself and to make use of others." So he's saying there that he. Yes, you will feel guilty. You've got to maybe confessing helps, but eventually you've just got to embrace it and not let it bog you down too much.、Mm-hmm. Uh, the man who、um, invades another country, or the man who cuts up another person in traffic, is Camus' prescription to both these people. You know, don't feel bad. There's no objective. Like there's no God to punish you. We'll all end up in limbo. If the message, if we take for a second that the message of the book is. Just accept your guilt and revolt against this this burden which is in placed by yourself on yourself.、Um, is is there any point to to feeling、uh, doing actions that lead to less guilt or more guilt? Do you see what I'm getting at? What? So you're saying the messages behave exactly the same? Yeah. Even whether you feel guilty about it or not. Yeah, and just yeah, don't worry about all the guilt you're going to cause yourself from your actions. You're inevitably going to do it, so you may as well do whatever. That, isn't that the I、is、mean, that, I don't know whether or not that's like the takeaway, as in like, I don't believe there is a moral necessarily to this this story because that would be very much against like the kind of style of it.、Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but then that that's assuming what you've just said there is assuming that like we believe Jean Baptiste to be like like worthy of attention and to listen to him.、Mm-hmm. Um, are we are we are we bro- like yeah? Do you mean onto, you like yeah. criticisms here? Yeah, sure. He calls himself、things. a prophet as well. Yeah, of course. Like so. Okay, so here's the thing, right? So he 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 seems to suggest that like we're all as guilty as one another,、yeah. and that like so like all of us are oppressors, all of us,、uh, even the oppressed, and all of this stuff. And、uh, I guess you could say to an extent, yeah, okay, sure, we're all guilty of our our crimes and and or like our inactions and all of that stuff. But there are there is like we could still have some level of justice where we can say like. Like I don't need to like a judge or a lawyer doesn't have to confess to the to the jury and say, "Oh, who am I to judge? I am too, but a, a flawed person." <laughs> It's like no, this person killed didn't a kill a guy though. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So like there is there is like a maybe like an amount that we could say that like right okay this person is a danger to society and like at, the, at that point we have the right to judge、mm. and they like. That doesn't mean that we should necessarily punish them, because like there's or like punish them at least in- incredibly to the point where like it would serve no true purpose to society, which is where like a whole bunch of interesting things about like criminology can come into right.、Mm. Like right, okay, so we're all flawed, but we can't then lock everybody up. <laughs> like we're not all going to be sent to the insane asylum.、Mm-hmm. So like in which case, if if somebody commits a serious crime. And we understand that maybe like there's some sort of like lack of control or like the, whatever like they can't be considered. Like, we can't punish this person so much, otherwise that might just make them a worse person. So、yeah. maybe like the role of the criminal justice system would need to flip in some way, in which you could say like, right, okay, we're going to try and work with these people to actually improve, so they don't end up committing even more serious crimes. But、mm-hmm. I think the idea that like. Who am I to judge? Type thing, or like, oh, I'll continue judging, but I'll just confess my own sins and kind of just let the whole thing play out in this big、uh, theater. Is is not good enough in the sense that like like people still feel suffering, right? So like,、mm-hmm. if you can't just let everything take its course. I mean, Jean Baptiste, if we're、uh, to take him on his word, seems to be quite flippant about things like the Holocaust,、yeah. as in like almost oh well, or slavery, you know, like yeah, the you know the Nazis and the and the Jews. There's not really much difference between the two, and it's like、mm, no, there is. Like we can we can make some pretty clear distinctions between the crimes of certain individuals and and the lesser crimes of others,、mm. and we don't have to put everybody in the same pool. Yes, okay. Everybody is is capable of bad things, but not everyone does commit bad things to the level of like serious pain and suffering towards others. Yeah, and it made me it made me think as well of like one of the they say that one of the biggest signs of someone who's like a sociopath or a psychopath is like a lack of empathy or guilt for what they've done. Right. So like if they do a really hor- someone does a really horrendous thing, and they feel no guilt. Or responsibility whatsoever for it, then we would look at that as something that is very unusual or abnormal or slightly strange,、um, which I think is kind of like an interesting way to look at it. I mean, I don't think we're supposed to see John Baptiste as the hero of this story and like <laughs>、no, follow、certainly. in his example. Like, if he doesn't learn the lesson, therefore we don't. I don't think that's the approach, right? So you can you can look at his story and the story he tells and still learn something about you from it without him going through that arc himself. 
yeah and i think that is really important where like i think for jean baptiste's own sense of self he mm. needs to hold the mirror up to you so like he doesn't feel as bad or as guilty like he wants you to be as guilty as he is that doesn't make that right okay mm. like so like okay yes right you can hold up the mirror and see like oh actually looking back on the last five days yeah maybe i have made a lot of mistakes but i'm still not you like i i i didn't <laughs> i didn't like go and make life difficult for others i didn't like sleep with a bunch of prostitutes and like treat that woman horribly okay like that that's on you mate like, that's not like, <laughs> like, don't, don't make me feel like i'm as guilty as, as mm. that right like so there is you don't have to accept him for his word he's, he's saying not that you are as guilty yeah but you are yeah sure but get ten, that, but, uh, so i'm just i'm humming over this last line um so i shall finally speak through your mouth young woman throw yourself in the water again so that i might at once more the opportunity to save us both um so he's asking, if you were to walk across the bridge and see a woman jump in, you're very likely going to die. Would you do it? And he's talking about the shift of uh, the blame in the example when he's talking to the younger solicitors. Um, you know, if you're going to persecute somebody, you'd bear in mind that you've probably got the potential to do that as well. So don't be so quick to judge them. If you contemplate my story, what you'll realize is that you yourself are definitely capable of these things. And when push comes to shove if you were put in the context of this you would do the same so take give the example which we've spoken about in the past on moral character we mentioned it in the christian b miller interview and greg mentioned this that so what so water boils at 100 degrees you go on to another uh, you know imagine that it's never given the opportunity to reach 100 degrees would you say still is it the disposition it does something need to do it to be called uh, boiling or just because in essence it has the potential to boil uh, does it contain the property of boiling does that make sense so i might kill someone in certain circumstance but if i'm never given that circumstance am i still an evil person um you might think it's a distinction between a uh, moral character uh, and moral actions isn't it so he's saying your moral character is just like mine so what you haven't put it into action inside you're just as bad as me um, and I recommend that you, you recognize this and, uh, and you know, this might come as a surprise. Yeah. And, and, and in that essence, I would entirely agree with him. I mean, like, again, linking back to the context of the whole story, I mean, you could certainly look at the amount of people that stood idly by as the Holocaust happened, mm -hmm. right? Like, so it, it's not as if like, like we're all capable of allowing horrific things to happen. Um, and I guess, yeah, in, in what you've just described there, maybe, like the alternative way to look at your life is just to say like count yourself lucky mm. that you haven't been pushed to the limit yeah because trust me you would so like take yeah, a really fine. sensitive example and it seems completely shocking that he's equating being uh being a jew to being a nazi and he's saying there's not much difference between you i think the reason why he gives such a shocking statement is that the nazis are just the byproduct of the social uh, and and their predisposition or their will to power and their nature combined with the environment they've been brought up in. He's saying if anyone else was brought up in that situation, they probably would have done the same thing. The only yeah, so I I'm I buy that to an extent. I think the only thing that you could criticize him heavily on is just his his sort of admittance at the end, which is sort of like I'm not going to change mm. because like that that might give the out to the Nazi right, whereas like. Oh well, as a product of my of my circumstances and all of the things that were in place, I was I took part in some horrific crimes of humanity, but like like I'm absolved type mm -hmm. of thing. Like like you can feel the guilt, but whatever. Um, I guess that's quite hard for a lot of people to accept. Um, and whether or not, I mean, presumably people would say, can we hold ourselves to even a higher standard than that? Well, or well that, not? that judgment idea is interesting, though, right? So we haven't really talked yet about kind of. You know, we've kind of said that, you know, John Baptiste feels all of a sudden feels the judgment from everybody. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think somebody raised a question. I can't remember who, like, you know, like who whose whose role is it to judge? You know, you know, if the judge or if, you know, like a lawyer stands up in court and goes, yes, we've all done bad things, me included. Um, you know, like I always find it's quite interesting working with children, how really judgmental children are and really harsh, like very much into the retribution, we shall say, of each other. If any of you students are listening, they are judging you now. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Um, whether it's the tone of my voice or whatever. Um, yeah. So I think that's quite interesting. Like, is there like an innate mm. judgment within us? Like, can we just not 
stop judging. Um, you know, entire industries are built up of people judging mm. um, other people as well. Um, it seems to be something which is quite innate. Yeah, I, I think we can... I, I, I'm going to criticise the idea, and, and this isn't criticising Kamuka, we're, we're criticising this particular reading of the four, we should put in the loader as well. Yeah, we can, people can live without judging each other. I think that's completely uh, possible. If you look at... Um, if, like Buddhist monks or someone like this, you can envisage somebody who doesn't spend their life making judgments about others. But take examples that we did the audio book and we looked at Deirdre Bonhoeffer and there's some great examples in the Second World War of people sacrificing themselves willingly, not saying, God, why have you forsaken me? Or thinking that their actions aren't selfish. There's clear examples of history of people that sacrifice their lives for, for selfless reasons. Um, so I think they're... It is achievable in some sense to live a, a life which um, Jean-Baptiste is, is saying is impossible. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I agree up to a point. I think there's still that essence. Because let's take the, the Buddhist monk example for a second, mm. which is that the Buddhist monk still has to recognize that like, within their psychology, there are these illusions that like, so the judgment that you have towards others and that you then have to go through like quite an extensive period of mindfulness meditation and, mm. and living a particular type of lifestyle before you begin to kind of calm those emotions and judgments towards others so like and if you're not in that position like if you haven't done those things yet then like yes i believe every human being it has an innate sense of judging the yeah. world like mm. that is deep within us but, whether it's the actions of others or just our judgments on the fact that like that that caused me distress or that could, caused me can, happiness can I jump in and, and say what, all of that stuff so judgment i want to say is not like a judgment like a, a football's kicked and i judge it's going to go in the goal or not mm -hmm. i'm speaking i think jean baptiste is talking as well just value judgments yeah judgments of morality and and, and what and the values and, and what they're doing yeah and i and i think there is that i i think there is a very deep sense of that within mm. within human nature like you you will make value judgments whether or not they're like factual like objective value judgments is not something that we're going to debate right now mm. but i think it's it completely natural for someone to to feel as if like that person let let the group down or something like that Agreed. I think it's yeah, definitely uh, the vast majority of humans do this. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is that Baptiste says, Jean Baptiste says, it's impossible not to do it. Do you think it's possible to for a human to not make value judgments of others, to not throw the stone? Mm, I think because again, going back to the Buddhist monk, it, I mean, I've I've not an enlightened monk, so I can't possibly Don't be modest. Come <laughs> yeah. on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I am. I'm very guilty. <laughs> <laughs> However, I think because what might happen, at least my understanding, is mm. that like these thoughts might come up to the surface, let's say, yeah. for the monk. But what they won't do is like attach like m meaning to it. They'll just let mm. it go. So the fo the thoughts and the feelings still arise, but then they recognize, okay, no, this is an illusion. Yeah. Let it go. And what most people can't do is let it go. So they, so they just ruminate on it and, then yeah. they, and they keep feeling the judgment. Mm. And the more you ruminate, the more you feel it's true. I would even say that within Christianity, you know, judge, judge not, let thou be judged. Um, you know, we're, Christians are encouraged not to judge each other or judge other people. But they also believe that everybody will be judged by God, mm. you know, on the day of judgment. So that expectation that there needs to be some form of judgment in order for there to be some kind of divine fairness oh, or good. justice, you know, so true justice requires some form of value judgment, mm -hmm. surely. Otherwise, you would be in a really weird situation where, yeah, the Nazi would be the same as the Jew. And that's not really a situation we want to be in, I think mm -hmm. most people would say. Um, and that would cause massive problems. So we spoke in the uh, episode 58 very briefly with Emily Thomas about uh, the, the guests, the, uh, maybe it was Sam Coleman, about uh, creative minds or minds that just uh, thoughts just surface in. I think that what you're speaking about here, Andrew, is really interesting that maybe judgment or, or the kind of judgment which um, Jean-Baptiste is saying, which we can't, which all people do is like this create you will that judgment you want you judge them in your mind and you enforce that so a creative mind is one so you've got unconscious thoughts and you you've got this feeling that you create a thought 
right? Uh, so the thoughts that you have are willed by yourself. But people like Galen Strawson and Robert Wright, and most Buddhists, I presume, think that thoughts are just something that you don't have control over. They just kind of pop into your mind. They go from the unconscious to the conscious. Well, some do at least. Mm -hmm. So you will have these judgments and it's natural to have them. But what we want to say back to Jean Baptiste is, yeah, I don't have control over these judgments that come into my mind, but it's not as if I will act on them. It's not as if I want them. Um, and therefore, I'm not a judgmental uh, person. So I have an inclination to eat lots of sugar donuts, right? I'm aware of that fact. Doesn't mean I'm going to go out and do it. Yes. So I'm not so, guilty in that sense. I, assuming that you ha like go through a certain, like, I think, and this is something that I think young people transition into when the, when they become more like adult, where they, they they are able to regulate their desires or or, or like negative thought patterns slightly better i've had about six don't like, <laughs> yeah well yeah we're not all we're not good yeah. we're not great at it and you but, should feel guilty about it jack um so i oh, sorry i've lost my thread a little bit <laughs> but, yeah because because younger but, people and people who are less experienced in life will just base everything off their pure carnal desires right yeah or like that's yeah, what they yeah. want like i want sugar i want sweets i don't want to eat broccoli um right or so like uh, that. yeah so that yeah thank you for you you got the thread back so that it's that feeling that like you said the like, so thoughts pop into our head yeah. and then our brains do a, an amazing job of believing that like, oh, I've come up with this great idea, but mm. it wasn't really you because there is no you. So like you're driven to get up the, like, get up out your seat, go pick up a donut and put it in your mouth and eat. But like, and you're, yeah. and then your mind, like, because it's an important idea that you feel like you have true agency. You think like, I made that choice. I put it in my mouth and I ate it. Mm. But really a lot of that was not within your conscious control yeah. it, like the consciousness tricks you into believing you were did in which sense yeah okay so a lot of the judgment that we feel pops up from the the unconscious as part like a deep part of our psychology mm -hmm. Poof. and if you are if you if you are kind of bought directly into the psycho like psychological illusion yeah you think like this is my judgment you deserve to be punished i'm gonna act on that judgment right mm. um However, you might be able to, with a lot of training, to see this thought come into your head and say, no, you know what? That doesn't require judgment. Yeah. I can let it go. And and then I think then it becomes a matter of, right, so which are the important judgments and which ones are not? And mm. you could say, like, right, so if someone commits, like, a great injustice or is, like, or is doing something towards someone who is entirely innocent, mm -hmm. then I think we can say quite safely that it is okay to pass judgment on that and and to act in the best interest of the person who is being attacked. Mm. And therefore you can get you can get away from this idea of like, oh, so horrible things are happening, who am I to judge? Because I think in that case, you can be okay to judge in the sense that assuming that you want to reduce the amount of suffering in the world, that's a pretty fair thing to judge on. Mm, good. Um, so just before we jump into concluding remarks, um, say you're walking across the lovely bridge, which is outside uh, the building today. If you were to walk across and there was a lady there and she jumped into the water and there's a high probability that you would die if you tried to save her, would you jump in on your heart of hearts, Andrew? See, like, I Time's know this uh, it sounds like a cop out, but I think until I was actually in that moment, I find it really hard to say if I would. I would quite happily admit right now that I could definitely envision a situation which I wouldn't. Okay. I will leave it at that. Ollie? I'd like to think I would, uh, but I think most people would also like to think they would. Hmm. So uh, it's difficult. And I think that what's interesting about the book, right, and, and The Fall, and in terms of the judgment of the main character, um, you know, I don't think he's a very good person. Mm -hmm. He's very, very selfish, and you are encouraged to judge him throughout the story. Um, and yeah, I think you should have jumped in and saved her. Yeah. I did. Again, it, I, I'd like to think that I would. I'm going to cop out and answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's that wonderful line at the, at the end. Throw yourself in the water again so that I might have once more the opportunity to save us both. A second time, huh? That would be rash. Uh, it, the thing is that she's jumped off and it's awoken uh, Jean-Baptiste to the absurdity of his actions and this virtuous life he thinks he's living. It's woke him up and he's trying to wake up as well us the reader um so i think it calls the listener now to reflect and ourselves to reflect on whether the lives that we're living are actually good are actually worthwhile um i mean one takeaway i'll interject one takeaway which i think is that 
sometimes there are moments that might present themselves in your life in which you might not be able to garner the true significance of them until mm. they've passed. And we might have to be a lot more aware of our surroundings and, or at least try to be as aware as possible to recognize these moments so that when the time comes where, and let's face it, like there might not be many moments in your life where you have to make a big ethical decision. There might only ever be one. Mm. And that like when that time comes, are you going to be the person who turns their back and lets the woman drown? Or are you going to jump? And like, you won't know until you get there, but you might want to think very carefully about how you would act. Mm. Yeah, good. That's a great take up. Should we do uh, some concluding remarks? Concluding remarks. There's the jingle. He wakes up the listener. Concluding remarks. Uh, so a round of concluding remarks. Does anyone want to jump in for... Andrew's waving his Whoa. hands like he's drowning in a river. Andrew, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I mean, it, it, my, I'll keep this reasonably brief. And uh, I, I said before we recorded that, and admittedly, I've not read all of Camus' books, so I couldn't possibly make this judgment particularly fairly. But out of the ones I have, uh, this is my favorite of his. Um, I, re I read this first maybe about three or four years ago. And then I've read it, I think, about four times since. And even just even just reading it again before this, I just I was engaged in it perhaps even more than I was the first time of reading it. Uh, I, it's, it's such a fascinating book. And the fact that it's only like 90 pages long on the edition that I have, he crams so many brilliant lines into this thing. It flows perfectly. The The monologue, is it, it works exactly how you'd want it, right? Like he's this narcissistic, uh, charismatic, charming man who brings you into his world and then just rips you apart um and in which sense like uh, absolutely outstanding piece of literature um and if you haven't read the book i mean by now sorry for spoiling it all but i can still <laughs> say go and read it because it's it really is fa fascinating um i'll leave it at that i think it's a it's a brilliant piece of work but yeah i think we're all going to agree on this uh, i really enjoyed reading the full and actually i agree with andy the first time i read it i was like yeah it's okay it's pretty good i think i got the general themes but i enjoyed it so much more the second time i read through it and i just completely missed the first time just how funny it is at times as well like the, the genuine wit and humor of this book considering it was written in obviously not in english and french and then translated um is, is is just superb it's so accessible i would say if you're not really interested in philosophy or to be honest if you're not really interested in literature too much it would be a bit weird if you were listening to this if you weren't interested in two of those things but there you go um if on Honestly, just it's an absurd world of yeah, these no, things right. happen. Yeah, they're not interested in it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, just give it a read. It's just really great. Um, it's 90 pages um, and it just grabs you from the start and, and doesn't let go. Um, truly, truly fantastic book. And I think the themes in it, and I know I'm just echoing what I said earlier and what Andy said so eloquently, but I think it's a truly timeless book. And, you know, the, the, the way you can judge art in, you know, in terms of how important is is if it can stand the test of time you know Shakespeare stands the test of time um, you know uh, Miles Davis will stand the test of time and I do believe that uh, this book will also stand the test of time the themes it touches on are so universal and so essential to who we are as human beings that um, yeah I agree with Andy I think in 500 years time people are still going to be reading it Mm, I agree with you both completely. It's been sat on my bookshelf for quite a while, so I've been looking forward to reading it. Uh, there's a reason why you won the Nobel Prize for Literature, isn't there? And uh, books like this stand out. Uh, it's like Andrew says, it's like 90 pages long and it's absolutely packed. You could sit and, and chew over a couple of lines of this for quite a while. Uh, and I think we've, um, it's very difficult not to, to go on and not on certain points. Um, there's still this tension in my mind between, uh, so I've been listening a bit lately on uh, the intention of the author, whether or not the meaning of a text is what the author says it is, whether or not we should uh, take the meanings for ourselves. Um, but I think it comes in two layers. You can do both. And I think that there's a great uh, way of, you could read it as Camus, Confession, but it also taps into some deeper rooted truths. I've never really thought about different aspects of the death of God in terms of you, know, you have to live with this guilt because I've never practiced uh, being a Christian. So I don't know what it's like and how liberating it is to confess your sins. It's obviously massively important. It's one of the sacraments. <laughs> I thought right? you were going to say, I don't know what it is to be guilty because <laughs> I've never done anything wrong. <laughs> now come have a gin with me. <laughs> Uh, but what it has done is it's reignited uh, my love uh, for Camus. I've just picked up uh, The Rebel, which is one which I'm going to uh, be reading over the next few weeks. Um, 
you know, and it's been a while. It's been about two years since I've read any Camus, so I've, I've really, really enjoyed it. And again, I recommend it to all listeners. And there's a PDF on the website if we haven't already <laughs> breached copyright law by reading most of the novel. Um, this might be our last episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get shut down. Oh, like oh, I, I've, I, I know I said I would keep it brief and that I was done, but I, I want to just mention one other little bit, and it's just about the style as well, which is like the amount of like contradiction in this book is a, like a fascinating little piece. Like the amount of times he says something and then says the the opposite, and like this duplicity throughout the entire thing. It's like the like the underlying theme of the entire book, and it just works. Uh, so again. Go read it. Right, I've, I've got to go speak to that decent man over there. Oh, he's a pretty good burglar too. Yeah, it's, it's just little things like that and they're, they're peppered all over the place. Well, let's pepper uh, with some pop pot philosophy quiz. Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. You ready, gentlemen? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to come up with a jingle each? Albert. Camus. Oh, come. Very good. I think we did that probably the last time as well. Like episode 16. It's episode 60. So what's that? Like 44 episodes ago, we did an episode. Different time. Does that not feel like... I was much doing less guilty back then. We realised we've been doing this for too long. 44 episodes. Yeah, in between that point, a woman jumped herself off the canal and, oh God, the laughter is... And the canal me. went, what, waist deep? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then got off. Hey, the Birmingham <laughs> canals are deeper than that, Ollie. <laughs> more canals than Venice. Really? Have you know. Yeah, yeah more trees than Paris as well. Yeah, oh, it's a wow. beautiful okay. city, Jack. Are we in Avent sponsored by the... Birmingham? <laughs> <laughs> <Is> it Birmingham? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Come to Birmingham. It's great. Okay, um, let's play Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Um, we're playing Albert Camurian. Okay, so we've got quotes from Al. Born in 1959, Weird Al Yankovic is an American singer-songwriter, record producer, satirist, film producer, actor, voice actor, comedian, author. So you've got Al as in Weird Al. Okay. You've got Bert as in Bertrand Russell, British philosopher, logician, mathematician. He actually won the Nobel Prize in Literature seven years before Albert Camus. Camurian Diaz, the American actress <laughs> writer. Again, I th- we've done that before, haven't we? Voicing <laughs> Princess Fiona in Shrek 1, 2, 3 and Shrek Forever After is her claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, you've got Albert Camus, the French Algerian philosopher, author and journalist. So, so you've got Albert Cameron Diaz and Camus. Albert Camus. Is this yeah. not the same one? There's Did we not do that exact quiz? Uh, right? For, uh, let's just carry on. As a kid, I certainly never thought I would get to spend my life doing something fun. But, oh no, Al- Albert, but. Can I give my answer? Um, so it's not Bert. Yeah, Ollie. I'm going to get his, a weird owl. It's weird owl. That's uh, one nil to Andy. Uh, the good life is one inspired by love and guided by knowledge. Camus. I'm going to go Bertrand Russell. That's Albert. Bertrand Russell. It's 2-0 to Andy. A happy life must be, to a great extent, a quiet life, for it is only in an atmosphere of quiet Camus. that true it's joy dare live. Albert Camus. It's not Albert Camus. Uh, it's Cameron Diaz. No, it's not Cameron Diaz. It's, uh, it's uh, Bertrand Russell. It's Bertrand yeah. Russell. That's three. I kiss a frog, even if there was no Albert. promise of Prince Cameron Charming. Diaz. It's Cameron Diaz. <laughs> there is but only one true philosophical Come on, problem. Come Camus. It's Albert Camus. <laughs> it's actually Cameron Diaz. She was very deep. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it is very it is handy. Wow. I've been noticing gravity since I was very young. Uh, Camus, Albert. that was a weird owl. That's not weird owl. That's Camus. That's not Camus. That's uh, it's Cameron Diaz. It's Cameron Diaz. <laughs> Five one to Andy. I'm very analytical. Albert. I'm very precise. Cameron Diaz. No. Uh, Camus. That is uh, Albert Camus. No. No. Oh, it's Al. It's, Al. it's weird Cam- Al. Yeah. It's five two. So far as I can remember, there is not one word in the Gospels in praise of Al- intelligence. Camus. That's uh, Bertrand, Bertrand Russell. Russell. That's, that's Bertrand. Russell. Russell. That's Bertrand. I both get the point there. Six three. What we women need to do instead Cam- of worrying about what we don't Diaz. have. Hey, no way. I I called my just name love first. What we Cameron. Do. Diaz, what is a rebel? A man who says uh, no. Camus, that's Albert Camus. <laughs> <laughs> that's three. All right, we get it. Andy's won. <laughs> you fake something until you're good at it. Albert Camus. Cameron Diaz. That's not Cameron Diaz. That's uh, Weird Al. That's Weird Al. That's nine three. We'll play first to ten. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you're nine three up. <laughs> yeah, but that's still just too much. We used to wonder how our Al. war lived. What it was that made us so vile. Camus, that's And Albert now Camus. we realise that what we know where it lives, that it ins- is inside. Camus, no. it's Albert Camus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
No, that was Cameron Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> In Shrek Forever After. <laughs> Poor Cameron Diaz. Potentially the fourth bad, best Shrek movie. <laughs> well, that was good fun, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was, Jack. I really thoroughly enjoyed that. Well, quiz. take. I uh, thank you. Take that gun away quite from a lot of quotes here. There is well, there's a lot. How, how long could that have gone on for? Uh, <laughs> Five episodes? <laughs> Great. Well, in the business of dragging things out, should we keep going? <laughs> Squeeze out another episode out of this. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Pan Sidecast. It's been a five-part special. Uh, guys, you think that's too much to spend on the fall? Yes, it is. Sorry, <laughs> listeners. Uh, <laughs> and dungeons were good at first, but, you know, selfish and all of that. Um, we've been doing uh, a lot of pan casting lately. Um, we've been doing a lot of reading and we're thinking of our next topic. We're thinking maybe stoicism, maybe, maybe some Emmanuel Kant again, then this some Chopin for Hour. you, Jim. To Jim we're doing Clare. Doing stoicism for you, Jim. So Jim Clare's one of our uh, most loyal and handsome patrons. Um, he is... Uh, uh, Supporting this show, yes. I don't know where I was going with that. Sorry, that just sounded like he's uh, really dreamy. <laughs> so, uh, thank you to Jim Clare for your support. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you also to Lily Hooper and David Lejeunesse who have been supporting us on Patreon. If you want to support the show, if you want access to the after shows that we do, if you just want to support the project, if you've listened to this five-part special and you want to give something back, allow us to carry on with just a very small donation. If it was a pound, if it was two pounds, anything can help support the show. Ollie, you got a message? Oh, if you're crippled with guilt and you can't handle it, give us money. That's a that's not a bad idea. And everyone is crippled with guilt. So, so everyone, everyone should give us give money. <laughs> guys, we'll be billionaires by the end of the month. <laughs> Why has no one thought of this? Thank you to West Hill Endowment and Cullum St. Gabriel's for supporting the show also. Um, but try and give us a five-star review. Try and tell a friend to help them. <laughs> try. try. <laughs> if you can, manage that. <laughs> this is a really weird try wrapping and, up. Try here, and do it? that unironically. Is there anything else we need to tell listeners to do as we're wrapping up here? No, just keep doing you. Keep to, keep on keeping on. Keep it up. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to the... No, do I, why do I say that twice? <laughs> thank That's you ridiculous. for listening. Thank, thank, thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful Soothing Voices. Thank you. You've been listening to the beautiful, wonderful, soothing voices of Mr. Ollie Marley. They'll be able to sum up modern man in a single sentence. He fornicated and read the papers. Mr. Jack Slimes. I did have principles, of course. One of which, for example, was that my friend's wives were scared. <laughs> <laughs> Sacred. I messed up that quote. <laughs> I did have principles, of course. One of which, for example, was that my friends' wives were sacred. It was just that, quite sincerely, I would stop being friends with the husbands a few days in advance. <laughs> <laughs> and me, Mr. Andrew Horton. That's what men are like, sir. Two-faced. They cannot love unless they love themselves. Two-faced, right? That was your quote. So you spent that much time and that was the Yeah, well, you, you know, I, I was looking for one particular one. That I you were just saying it, so how just full this on. book was of great <laughs> yeah. quotes. And then I picked... A an average one. I wanted to pick one that summed up the theme.